Item Number SCP-118 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Due to the number and distribution of SCP-118, containment of every specimen is impossible. Known SCP-118 red zones are to be closed off to all civilian marine vessels and divers under the guise of a military presence or other plausible cover story. Contacts in navies known to operate near SCP-118 red zones are to be utilized in order to minimize the passage of military vessels through the red zones. If any area within the red zone has a depth of less than 1500 meters, the restriction is to be applied to aircraft as well. All human activity in surrounding yellow zones is to be monitored, and any non-military vessels or individuals approaching the red zone are to be turned away. In the red and yellow zones, protocol Toxic Harvest is to be followed to ensure the removal of devices generated by SCP-118. Furthermore, protocol Cell Watch is to be followed to ensure the early detection of any emerging red zones. Samples of SCP-118 can be stored using standard containment procedures for non-virulent anomalous microbes. Description SCP-118 is a species of ocean-dwelling protista that is capable of assembling functional, self-initiating nuclear devices from materials present in ocean water. While SCP-118 is unknown, and hence has not been classified by the scientific community, specimens resemble protists of the phylum Euglenophyta, but have significantly increased levels of movement speed, nutrient storage capability, and resistance to alpha radiation. Specimens of SCP-118 have been found in all of the world's oceans and seas. When in a survivable saltwater environment, specimens of SCP-118 will seek out materials including but not limited to iron, silver, copper, carbon, TNT, and uranium isotopes. When SCP-118 is located a material of interest, the material is absorbed into the cell using a method dependent on the size of the material. Single atoms and molecules, mostly substances that are dissolved in the water, are passed through the cellular membrane through specialized protein pumps. Larger particles smaller than the cell itself are ingested through phagocytosis. Larger pieces will have particles torn off through an unknown mechanism, which are then absorbed using the first two methods. This mining occurs even in solid and hard substances, such as metal ingots. Upon reaching a threshold of absorbed materials, Specimens of SCP-118 will move towards an assembly area on the bottom of the body of water they are present in, and will contribute to the assembly of a nuclear device. The nuclear devices assembled are gun-type fission devices, using uranium-235 as their fissile material. Observation of devices in the process of being assembled show that the process starts with the assembly of a metallic rounded cylindrical casing for the device followed by the creation of two subcritical masses of uranium and the conventional explosives to propel them into each other. The device is then finished with the assembly of a uranium-238 tamper, where the two uranium masses will collide, and the assembly of a trigger mechanism. SCP-118 appears to assemble the necessary components by adding minuscule amounts of material to an initially tiny material seed. Differing atoms and molecules can be added to the same component, and assembled components are not necessarily homogeneous. It is currently unknown whether SCP-118 builds on the seed atom by atom, or by adding very small sub-micrometer fragments. The mechanism by which SCP-118 attaches new material to the seed seamlessly is unknown. The assembly time depends on the size of the device being assembled, water conditions, and mineral availability. But observations suggest that 300 days for a medium-sized device can be considered average. Once a nuclear device is finished, SCP-118 will detonate the device by completing a circuit in the trigger mechanism. Around 90% of the nuclear explosions recorded as a result of SCP-118 have had yields in the 20 to 35 kiloton range, although yields as low as 4 kilotons and up to kilotons have been reported. Aside from cases involving human interference, failure to detonate has never been observed as all nuclear devices recorded have either been detonated of their own accord or removed from the water prior to completion. Devices constructed by SCP-118 appear to be larger than man-made devices of similar design and yield, presumably due to the neutron-moderating effect of the water that separates the uranium masses throughout much of the device's construction. 
A given assembly area typically has between one and three devices in the process of assembly at any given time, although as many as six at a time has been observed. In zones where multiple devices are being simultaneously assembled, the devices are separated by enough distance to prevent the detonation of one from destroying or setting off the others. While the Foundation is unable to prevent civilians and other organizations from obtaining samples of SCP-118, its superficial similarity to existing species, few numbers, relative to all oceanic protista, lack of anomalous behavior outside material-rich bodies of water, and the Foundation's standard monitoring of scientific studies at risk of uncovering information about anomalous biological species ensures that the chance of SCP-118's true nature being determined through cell samples is minimal. There are currently six different active SCP-118 assembly areas known to the Foundation. While the natural disappearance of an assembly area has been observed, the current consensus among researchers assigned to SCP-118 is that elimination of assembly areas without massively noticeable effects is currently unfeasible. Thus, containment is to be established at SCP-118's assembly areas, to be designated red zones and surrounding yellow zones. Furthermore, areas with elevated concentrations of SCP-118, zones of interest, are to be monitored for signs of assembly areas. SCP-118 Containment Zones Red Zone lies within city limits. This, combined with the shallow average depth of Red Zone, the heavy shipping traffic in the area, the ongoing tensions between and a nuclear power, and the presence of Foundation personnel and facilities in the city, makes a nuclear detonation in this red zone unacceptable. In addition, heavy ship traffic through the area and heavy air traffic above the city make restricting access for any long period of time impractical. Addendum 118-1 Following the USS incident, the exclusion radius used when drawing red zones had been increased. Containment protocol Toxic Harvest has been updated. Addendum 118-2 With the signing of the Partial Test Ban Treaty, and growing number and capability of nuclear detonation detection methods in use. The consequences of nuclear detonations caused by SCP-118 have increased. Containment protocols have been revised in light of these facts. Addendum 118-3 Due to the significant cost of containing SCP-118 red zones, the O5 Council has requested trials on possible methods to eliminate SCP-118 assembly areas. Red Zone Eradication Trials Summary Introduction Researchers with access to the files on SCP-118 are allowed to submit proposals to eradicate an SCP-118 assembly area with acceptable levels of collateral damage. The ones approved by Toxic Harvest Command and the O5 Council will be carried out. Trials are to be performed in Red Zone Proposal Sterilization of unfinished nuclear device in immediate surroundings using a UV light emitter. Approval. Approved. Result. Area around unfinished warhead initially free of microorganisms. However, SCP-118 concentration returned to normal levels within an hour. Non-sustained sterilization of sites seems ineffectual. Any method we come up with will have to keep the red zone, or at least the sea floor of it, free of SCP-118 for an extended period of time. Dr. Brandt Proposal Sodium hypochloride pumped to ocean floor Approval Denied Result N.A. The chemicals will disperse too much to be effective. Any amount sufficient to reduce SCP-118's numbers will cause massive ecological damage. Dr. Klaus Proposal Depth Charge Bombardment of Ocean Floor to Break Up Under Assembly Devices Approval Denied Result N.A. Aside from the fact this would break our naval budget, the chances of triggering the conventional explosive in the devices and causing a fizzle is too high. It would also make our activities even more detectable with hydrophones. Dr. Klaus Proposal Sweeping of Ocean using a Cobalt-60 powered directional gamma-ray emitter. Approval. Approved. Result. While procedure resulted in the sterilization of swept area, procedure was far too slow to sterilize entire red zone before specimens returned. Keeping entire red zone sterile would require impractical numbers of emitters and vessels. While it's a shame the device cannot get rid of the red zones for us, I think it can be of use to our device recovery teams. 
The gamma rays can sterilize the devices we recover to prevent undesired detonations during the recovery of almost complete devices. The gamma rays can also penetrate into areas where our current chemical and UV sterilization methods can't reach. Captain Thompson, RZ-3 Zone Commander Proposal A plastic membrane to block access to ocean floor at Red Zone Approval Proof of concept on one under assembly warhead approved Result First attempt was unable to acquire a watertight seal around warhead. Membrane in second attempt was too fragile for ocean conditions and was torn off its moors. Third membrane, manufactured using a thicker and sturdier design, had hundreds of micro tears ripped in it within hours, possibly due to SCP-118's mining action. Not surprising, considering that SCP-118 has been known to wear through the casings of old artillery shells to harvest the explosives within. We had hoped that cutting off the assembly area would work better than cutting off the raw materials. Dr. Klaus Proposal Compound Pump to Ocean Floor Note Proposed by Dr. Former researcher for SCP-118 currently working at one of the Foundation's chemical research divisions. Tests confirm that compound is lethal to SCP-118, remains concentrated at bottom of water, and degrades into relatively harmless chemicals in water over a period of 15 hours. Approval Approved Result Over one week, SCP-118 concentrations on ocean floor fell to 3% of previous levels. No signs of progress observed on two known uncompleted nuclear devices in Red Zone. However, 100 days after the start of the experiment, an underassembly nuclear device was detected 60 kilometers north of the Red Zone. Measurements in the area indicated vastly elevated levels of SCP-118, and the area around Discovery was reclassified as a red zone. Furthermore, the unexpected breakdown of compound by certain species of oceanic bacteria resulted in toxic byproducts that caused a noticeable die-off of fish in treated zone. Upon stoppage of experiment, red zone was observed to gradually migrate back to former location. It seems that making a red zone non-viable served only to move SCP-118's assembly areas to a new location. Nevertheless, perhaps if we can improve compound or find a new one whose application is more subtle, we can move red zones into areas away from areas of human habitation or commercial activity. Dr. Proposal Use of SCP Approval Denied Result N.A. SCP has classified properties that preclude its use in such a manner. 055. Conclusion Due to increased media attention to areas around one of Red Zone, due to aftermath of the application of compound, and the lack of proposals without high risks of substantial collateral damage, testing in said Red Zone has been suspended. Addendum 118.4 our research has determined SCP-118 enriches uranium by exploiting the fact that U-235 has a slightly greater preference for a high oxidation state than U-238. SCP-118 specimens which have harvested large amounts of uranium and are near assembly areas appear to develop specialized organelles resembling a series of thousands of vacuole-like chambers, with mitochondria-like organelles within them, responsible for catalyzing reduction and oxidation reactions. In a given chamber, Uranium is repeatedly reduced and oxidized. Compounds with uranium in higher oxidation states are transferred up the chain of chambers, while compounds with lower oxidation states are transferred down the chain. This results in a small amount of highly enriched uranium at the very end of the chain. Researchers and engineers at Research Sector have managed to create a prototype uranium enrichment device based on the principles employed by SCP-118. While the prototype was unable to produce weapons-grade uranium without using unreasonable amounts of time, it was successful in producing reactor-grade uranium, albeit at significantly greater cost than conventional methods. Despite its current limitations, the idea shows promise, and I have forwarded our findings to the relevant front companies. Dr. Lesson complete. If you missed the previous orientation, go watch SCP-117 complete multi-tool right now or for the complete course watch this playlist item number scp-157 
Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures When not being used in an experiment, SCP-157 is to be stored in its cryptobiotic form in a dry, airtight container. It is estimated that SCP-157 can survive in this condition for at least 10 years. Specimens needed for experimentation can be removed from storage and given water then food to restore them to a usable state. Personnel working with an active SCP-157 colony are cautioned not to eat, drink, change clothing, or apply any substance to their body in the presence of SCP-157. Foundation MTF agents are authorized to administer Class A amnestics to any survivors or witnesses of wild SCP-157 attacks. Description SCP-157 is a previously unknown microscopic animal in the tardigrade phylum, adapted to live on land as a predator. Like other tardigrades, SCP-157 is extremely resistant to environmental damage and can enter a cryptobiotic state when no food is present. SCP-157 normally exists as an amorphous mass composed of millions of individual organisms. In this form, it can slowly crawl and climb. SCP-157 colonies are predatory and can attack insects and small animals by engulfing them and then slowly dissolving their prey with digestive enzymes. Humans and other large prey are not normally attacked directly by SCP-157 colonies as they are too large to engulf and long-term contact is necessary for SCP-157 to successfully feed. The organism has developed an alternative method of achieving such contact. SCP-157 colonies possess an innate telepathic ability. When in the presence of prey that is too large to directly attack, the SCP-157 colony will use telepathy to present the illusion of something its prey wants to eat, wear, or apply to its body. SCP-157 is highly toxic when eaten. Someone having done so requires antidotes to and within 20 minutes as well as immediate gastric surgery to remove the portion that was eaten. When applied to human or animal skin, SCP-157 will produce an anesthetic to encourage prey to ignore pain and leave the organism in place. It then dissolves and consumes the skin within 30 minutes to 2 hours. Dead prey is rapidly consumed, and SCP-157 will grow significantly as it feeds. When reaching a size of 5 kilograms, SCP-157 will split into smaller colonies that move off in search of new prey. When in the presence of two or more individuals, SCP-157 will have an inconsistent appearance. It may appear to be a food item to one person and an article of clothing to another. This can serve as a warning and prevent exposure to the organism. Addendum Note that due to its resilient nature, SCP-157 can be split into smaller pieces, boiled, microwaved, etc., and remain alive and dangerous. SCP-157 Capture Incidents Incident 157-01 Found with extensive scalp damage after mistaking SCP-157 for a bottle of shampoo and applying some to his hair. Victim was apparently immune to SCP-157's anesthetic and began screaming, attracting the attention of his wife, who had been eating a snack. It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. He had a pastrami sandwich on his head, and it was eating him. Victim treated for chemical burns. SCP-157 captured alive. Victim and wife given Class A amnestics and released. Incident 157-02 Found partially consumed by SCP-157 in his office after apparently believing SCP-157 was a pair of socks and wearing them. Victim bled to death after feet and lower legs were mostly dissolved. Incident 157-03 Standard monitoring of police reports revealed a missing persons case where the investigating officers observed a couch, slowly attempting to crawl towards the door of the victim's apartment. Couch initially sealed in area by police. Foundation agents later determined it to be an unusually large variant of SCP-157 and contained the specimen. Amnestics administered. Although large enough to attack humans directly, 
This specimen prefers to use its telepathic ability to attract prey, in the manner of smaller SCP-157 colonies. Lesson complete. If you missed the previous orientation, go watch SCP-156, Reanimating Pomegranate, right now. Or, for the complete course, watch this playlist. Item Number SCP-204 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-204-1 and SCP-204-2 are to be kept in a 10 meter by 10 meter fortified holding area. In sight, the holding area must be constructed out of armor-plated steel and heavily reinforced concrete. The holding area must also be vacuum sealed and contained within an outer shell with a higher air pressure that must be always maintained, with at least two PSI over the current air pressure in the holding area. At least one full security team must be kept on standby at all times. It is only during SCP-2041's scheduled feeding times that D-Class personnel are allowed to enter, for the purposes of maintenance. SCP-2041's typical diet consists of any kind of meat, preferably from living subjects. Such subjects will often consist of aggressive animals, such as wild dogs, bulls, or any other animal that must be euthanized due to aggression. However, D-Class personnel will also suffice, if such food sources are unavailable. SCP-2042's diet consists of a regular human diet, with no special measures given. SCP-2042 is allowed to make special requests, but any and all requests must be given O5 approval. Any personnel caught attempting to deliberately provoke SCP-2042 will be immediately terminated. Security personnel are required to ignore any and all of SCP-2042's attempts to provoke a response from them, unless there is a clear and present risk of containment breach. Failure to do so will result in harsh administrative punishment. When SCP-2042 is about to turn the age of 14, the Foundation must initiate Containment Protocol 204. Further details may be found in Containment Protocol 204 requirements. In the event of a containment breach, EMP generators must be immediately activated in order to keep SCP-2041 disabled. Once EMP generators have been activated, security teams have approximately 30 seconds to neutralize SCP-2042 before SCP-2041 can adapt and reassemble itself. If containment cannot be achieved in this time, SCP-2041 must be contained by conventional means. Security teams and agents are authorized to use any conventional weaponry at their disposal to contain SCP-2041 and SCP-2042. If SCP-2042 is terminated during containment, then Containment Protocol 204 must immediately be initiated. Description SCP-2041 is a semi-organic nanomachine colony that follows SCP-2042 as a form of protector. SCP-2041 spends the majority of its time in a dispersed cloud, where it is almost impossible to perceive with normal human senses. However, if SCP-2042 is put into danger, or if SCP-2042 commands it to, SCP-2041 will instantaneously materialize into a solid, physical form. The exact shape and nature of this form is subjective, depending wholly upon SCP-2042's view, state of mind, and imagination. Despite its variable nature, SCP-2041 has a number of common traits. These include massive strength, large size, basic intelligence, perfect obedience to SCP-2042, and the ability to regenerate itself after consuming living flesh. SCP-2041 is vulnerable to conventional weaponry and can be temporarily forced back into its dispersed state if enough damage is inflicted. SCP-2042 is always a child, ranging from 4 to 14 years old. Physically, there is nothing outstanding about SCP-2042 besides its ability to call upon SCP-2041. All incidences of SCP-2042 have common traits. All of them have had a history of abuse and danger, 
with many developing acute mental disorders as a result. This makes instances of SCP-2042 difficult to contain in any traditional manner, as great care must be taken to keep them in a stable state. It appears that SCP-2041 is attracted to such children, though why or how it finds them is currently unknown. If SCP-2042 is terminated or reaches the age of 14, then SCP-2041 will abandon it and find a new child to imprint on. As a form of self-preservation, if SCP-2041 cannot find a suitable child, it will immediately materialize and go berserk, attacking anything in sight. Once SCP-2041 finds a suitable candidate to protect, it immediately imprints upon SCP-2042 and will follow it until SCP-2042 expires or until SCP-2041 decides to leave of its own accord. At first, SCP-2041 appears benign, protecting SCP-2042 from overt threats. However, through careful study and observation, it has been noted that all incidences of SCP-2042 begin to adopt much more aggressive, danger-seeking behavior with little regard for human life. It is theorized that SCP-2041 is able to manipulate SCP-2042's thought processes in order to behave in a fashion that would benefit it. It is assumed that since SCP-2041 requires organic flesh for sustenance, it needs SCP-2042 to be in danger in order to justify its activation. Addendum 1 There have been numerous recorded incidences where it is believed that SCP-2041 has been involved. The first such recorded incident was when a car was found in a residential street, completely torn apart and covered in partially devoured human remains. Similar incidents occurred until agents managed to track SCP-2041 to where they made contact with the first recorded incarnation of SCP-2042. It took three more attempts and numerous casualties before SCP-2041 and SCP-2042 were successfully contained. Interviews with SCP-2042 revealed that it seemed to feel a need to experience danger, such as standing in traffic or provoking hostile responses from others. When questioned on its reasons, SCP-2042 simply replied that SCP-2041 allowed it to. Containment Protocol 204 In order to keep SCP-2041 successfully contained, it has been necessary to keep a permanent stock of candidates to replace SCP-2042 in the event that the current one is terminated or abandoned. Ideally, all candidates should be orphans, below the age of 10, with a history of abuse. However, in times of need, Article 12 of Containment Protocol 204 may be authorized to allow candidates that don't meet specific requirements. They will be put under the supervision of caretakers, which will consist of D-Class personnel convicted of violent crimes and with Foundation staff present to prevent inadvertent termination of candidates. If SCP-2042 successfully reaches the cutoff age of 14 years, and SCP-2041 abandons it, the former SCP-2042 must undergo a rigorous amnestic treatment and a thorough psychological examination before being reintegrated into a government foster program. If it is deemed that the former SCP-2042 cannot be successfully reintegrated, then the subject must be immediately terminated. Addendum 2 As of the writing of this report, the Foundation has contained 13 instances of SCP-2042. Eleven instances exhibited the trademark hostile and violent behavior typical among all instances of SCP-2042. However, two instances of SCP-2042 showed a marked improvement in their mental health and stability and had the lowest number of containment breach attempts. It is currently unclear what specific factors trigger these differences in behavior as the exact mechanism SCP-2041 uses to manipulate its host is still unknown. Addendum 3 Though there is evidence to suggest that SCP-2041 may be sentient, or possibly even sapient, all attempts to communicate directly with SCP-2041 have resulted in failure. Currently, the only feasible method of communicating with SCP-2041 is to use SCP-2042 as an intermediary. Unfortunately, 
The violent tendencies and hostile behavior exhibited by nearly all instances of SCP-2042, as well as their questionable mental stability, make this approach highly unreliable. Lesson complete. If you missed the previous orientation, go watch SCP-203, Tortured Iron Soul, right now. Or for the complete course, watch this playlist. Item Number SCP-236 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Any and all materials leaving the containment area are to be scanned for any contamination by SCP-236. Any objects showing contamination by SCP-236 are to be immediately returned to the containment area and cleared of contamination. Personnel leaving the containment area must submit to a full physical examination and x-ray. No objects are to be left in the containment area without personnel present. Any objects appearing in the containment area are not to be touched until cleared by supervising personnel. Blast doors are to be opened only to allow personnel in and out of the containment area. No sudden movement or aggressive action of any kind is allowed in the containment area. Containment area is to be kept as dark as possible, with night vision goggles recommended for all interacting personnel. Should traditional lighting be necessary, lights must be turned on remotely, and a waiting period of one hour is to be observed before entry will be allowed. Description SCP-236 appears to be a swarm of near-microscopic crabs. Individuals match no known form of crustacean, and elements of their physiology appear to point to an artificial origin. SCP-236 appears to operate under a form of collective intelligence, or hive mind. This intelligence appears to grow when individual SCP-236 are in close proximity and dissipate when they are divided. Large swarms appear to exhibit predatory intelligence and become significantly more aggressive than individuals. Swarms show aptitude with problem solving, encircling tactics, and stealth. In addition, swarms appear able to take on the physical aspects and appearance of inanimate objects, such as doors, chairs, or even complex patterns, such as those found in paintings, for extended periods of time. This mimicry is near perfect under casual observation and requires detailed observation to detect. Swarms will sometimes even destroy existing objects and replace them in what appears to be an attempt at better disguise. SCP-236 can create additional individuals from any organic matter. This includes wood, cotton, or other materials derived from an organic source. SCP-236 units appear to remove small portions of matter with their pincers, consume it, then lay small spherical eggs, which hatch into new members after 10 minutes. Juvenile SCP-236 look identical to adults, but are smaller in size and lack the chemicals used in the defensive response. Juveniles reach full adult size after 6 hours. SCP-236 individuals appear to fear light, rapid movement, or loud noises. This fear is reduced in proportion to the number of units in a swarm, but even large collectives can be startled by a sudden sound or bright light. SCP-236 that are startled while mimicking an object will rapidly break apart into individual units, which will then scatter and hide. Swarm regrouping can take up to 24 hours. When cornered or unable to escape quickly, SCP-236 units will initiate their defensive response. This entails a unit raising its pincers and then detonating with an explosion equivalent to 9.07 kilograms or 20 pounds of C4 explosive. Initial research suggests that this is the result of an internal chemical reaction involving the mixing of three normally inert chemicals. Collection of these chemicals has been problematic due to the relatively minute size of the storage chambers and the likelihood of startling SCP-236 during the procedure. SCP-236 will use humans or any other living thing as a resource provided the swarm is of a sufficient size. Moderate-sized swarms can convert a whole human being in less than five minutes. Individual SCP-236 have also been observed entering the human body, 
typically while the subject is asleep, and begin to consume it from the inside out. This behavior, coupled with mimicry and the defensive response, make SCP-236 very difficult to detect and contain effectively. Addendum. While SCP-236 has not been observed to mimic organic life, the possibility exists for SCP-236 to develop this behavior. Notably, during testing with SCP-2366 when SCP-236 mimicked a brown bear and began to exhibit increased predatory behavior, and data expunged, such formations are to be immediately reported and testing area cleared immediately. Lesson complete. If you missed the previous orientation, go watch SCP-235, Phonographic Records, right now. Or, for the complete course, watch this playlist. Item Number SCP-584 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Vile samples of SCP-584 are to be kept in cold storage in accordance with established biohazard protocols, and access is restricted to personnel of at least Level 2 clearance. Research requires Level 3 approval. Subjects accidentally contaminated with SCP-584 must be quarantined immediately, as contact biohazards, and must submit to involuntary antiviral treatment. If subject shows no signs of lesion activity for 12 weeks, and tests negative in two consecutive biopsies, Performed at 6 and 12 weeks following exposure, quarantine procedures can be downgraded. Follow-up biopsies at 12 and 24 months must also return negative results before the subject is to be considered clean. Any subject with a positive test for SCP-584 or displaying characteristic lesions should be terminated. Description SCP-584 is a highly infectious viral pathogen that if left untreated, causes a disfiguring overgrowth of supernumerary limbs. See file photos. Structurally similar to the herpes simplex family of viruses, SCP-584 spreads via direct person-to-person -person contact and through contact with infected bodily fluids, and can also cross the placental barrier from an infected mother to her fetus, resulting in characteristic birth defects. SCP-584 typically lies dormant, deep in the dermal tissue of those infected, largely suppressed by the immune system, except for sporadic outbreaks. It is estimated that upwards of 80% of those exposed to the virus are asymptomatic carriers, making actual infection rates unknowable. Current estimates place the highest rates of infection in Asia, particularly India and China, where the virus likely originated. The virus appears limited to humans. An outbreak of SCP-584 typically begins with the appearance of a small, around 2 cm, painless lesion, mostly common on the extremities. Often, these lesions appear similar to warts or skin tags. If not removed, the lesion will quickly grow to resemble a fully functional, though often undersized, appendage. Often the appendage will be appropriate to the limb on which the lesion appeared, i.e extra toes on a foot, extra hands on an arm, etc. But severe outbreaks can trigger severely disfiguring chaotic lesion formation elsewhere on the body, such as the head and torso. Lesions can appear singly or in groups. Notably, SCP-584 has been shown to be able to regenerate missing limbs or digits in subjects who lost them due to accident or congenital, non-genetic, defects. These replacement appendages are full-sized and fully functional. It is believed that SCP-584 functions by activating regenerative biological processes that normally cease shortly after embryonic formation. However, SCP-584's effect seems restricted to external organs and appendages only. Antiviral treatment is quite effective at limiting and stopping outbreaks of SCP-584, but currently there is no cure for the virus. and. It is highly communicable. Drug therapy has even been found to stop the growth of lesions in advanced developmental stages. However, it is not effective once the appendage is fully formed. 
Surgical removal of lesions is only effective in the long term, if coupled with drug therapy, as scar sites are prone to developing recurrent lesions. SCP-584 infection in unborn babies, especially if contracted during the first trimester, has resulted in high rates of polymelia, extra limbs, polydactyly, extra fingers, and parasitic twinning. Lesson complete. If you missed the previous orientation, go watch SCP-583 Deathly Videotape right now. Or for the complete course, watch this playlist. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.